I'm in Joshua chapter 3, and this is going to be about the road to blessings, the road to recovery, the road to victory. Over in Joshua 18.3, Joshua said to Israel, How long are ye slack to go possess the land? At times Israel would resemble some saints today who have a slack hand, like Proverbs 10.4 talks about. You know, their feet run to mischief, not to the right road. You want to get on the right road. Joshua and Israel are about to take a step of faith and get on that road. You know, they could have they could have camped out on the wrong side of Jordan until they just died, but why miss the victory on the other side? You could get saved and just live for yourself the rest of your life, but don't you want to get on the road to recovery, the road to blessing, the road to victory? You know, you sit and dream of something good to come in your life, but you would rather just simulate these fantasies in your mind than to actually get out and do these things. You know, maybe you're in church every time the doors are open, but you're only simulating the Christian life. You might even make friends with good Christians and pastors so you can vicariously live a victorious Christian life through them. But you personally with the help of the Lord, have to get up and get on the road yourself. So, let's look at Joshua 3 and find some ways to get on this road to blessing, this road to recovery and victory. Let's read some. In Joshua chapter 3, verse 1, it says, And Joshua rose early in the morning. That's a key. And they removed from Shittim. Notice that word removed. You're going to see it a lot. And came to Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. And it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host, and they commanded the people, saying, When ye see the Ark of the Covenant, now that's a key, the Ark of the Covenant, of the Lord your God, and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then you shall remove from your place. So there's that word again. Remove from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, that you may know the way by which you must go. For ye have not passed this way heretofore. Meaning they haven't done it before. And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua spake unto the priests, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant, and pass over before the people. And they took up the Ark of the Covenant, and went before this people. Went before the people. Now, the first thing is, if you want to be on this road to a victory, this road to recovering from your sinful lifestyle or the slack lifestyle that you're on, you need to look at verse 1 and do what Joshua did. It says, And Joshua rose early in the morning. You need to rise early in the morning. That's the first thing. Write that down. Rise early in the morning. And it's not just Joshua that rose early in the morning. And he did it many times here in Joshua 3. He does it in Joshua 6.12. He does it in Joshua 7.16, Joshua 8.10. He does it so many times. Abraham did it in Genesis 22 in the chapter where he went to offer Isaac, his son, on the altar. Moses did it when he was going to get the Ten Commandments in Exodus 34.4. David does it before he fights Goliath in 1 Samuel 17.20. Jesus Christ himself rose up early in the morning. Rising up early in the morning is a key. And here's why. When you rise up early in the morning, you're avoiding the road of procrastination. You know, you're just on this, you're not on a road, period. You're not even getting up. You got to get up early and you avoid the road of procrastination. 
Joshua had already been waiting 40 years to get into the promised land. It was time to move. You know, you've been waiting too long to enter the victorious Christian life. It's time to move. Paul says, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead. In Ephesians 5.14. He says in Romans 13.11, It's high time to awake out of sleep. You know, while you're sitting and waiting for God to show you the will of God, you can already do what you already know is His will. And like in Romans 12, 2, 2 Corinthians 8, 5, Ephesians 6, 6, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, that shows you the will of God. There's all kinds of the will of God for you to do right now before you figure out what you're going to do. You know, drowsiness in the Bible says it'll clothe a man with rags in Proverbs 23, 21. You know, you're so drowsy, you don't want to get up out of bed, you don't want to do nothing, you're clothing yourself with rags. And that's true for this life. And maybe, you know, they've got it fixed to where they're trying to cheat the Bible, and even though you, you're lazy, you still got everything you want, well... It's going to be true for the judgment seat of Christ. If you're saved and you get to the judgment seat of Christ, drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. You know, are you going to earn anything to put on at the judgment seat of Christ? Or are you just going to be get up there and be found naked at the judgment seat of Christ? Drowsiness shall clothe, clothe a man with rags. You need to be building up on your foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. You need to be living in light of the judgment seat of Christ and avoid the road to procrastination. You can't begin on this road to victory while you're asleep. You're so sleepy. You're so drowsy. No wonder you're swerving around. No wonder you aren't making any progress. You know, in 1 Timothy 1.6, Paul says, From which some having swerved, having turned aside and a vain jangling. He talks about people making shipwreck in 1 Timothy 1.19. You're, you're so drowsy, you're wrecking the car. But Joshua, he's getting up bright and early. He's bright-eyed. Now here's some tips on rising early in the morning. Now think about it. The evening and the morning are the first day, according to Genesis 1.5. Think about that. The evening and the morning, it says. Not the morning and the evening. It says the evening and the morning. You know, your day should start in the evening. So you prepare for the next day in the evening. For example, each night I get my clothes ready. I get my lunch packed. I, if I'm going to drink coffee the next morning, I got a timer set for my coffee to be done when I'm heading out the door. No snooze buttons. Don't check social media. Just get straight into your prayer time, your reading time, your study time, or however you start your day with the Lord. I just go to the living room real fast, throw my clothes on, get my coffee, and I'm ready to go. And that saves me so much time. I'm not taking a shower, doing all this stuff that I did the night before. If I don't have to do all that stuff in the morning and i got so much time, alone, quiet time, and I'm avoiding the road to procrastination, I'm rising up early in the morning. And Joshua says, in Joshua 3, 9, it says, And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, Come hither and hear the words of the Lord your God. So they arose up early in the morning, and the morning began with something from God. So you got to rise up early in the morning. You've got to do this to avoid the road to procrastination. And you got to do this to awake to a road less populated. You know, when you go on a trip and you wake up early to get on the road, there's a lot less traffic and a lot less distractions. You might possibly get to your destination an hour sooner by leaving early. You're awaking to a road less populated. You know, I like to rise early in the morning at 4 a.m., two hours before work, to get my best study time in. Everyone in the house is asleep. 
I can work without distraction. I can study. I can pray. I can read. I can get these lessons recorded. I can get them together. Another reason the road to blessing, the road to victory, the road to recovery is less populated is because it is a sanctified road. And Joshua 3, 5 Joshua says to the people, and Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. This road is not very populated because it's a sanctified road. Nobody wants to sanctify themselves. And sanctify means set apart. Nobody wants to set themselves apart from the world. Nobody wants to do what the Lord would have them do. If you're going to make it far on this road, then you don't enter into the path of the wicked and go not in the way of evil men, as Proverbs 4.14 talks about. You have to be set apart for the Lord's work. So Joshua chapter 3, let's read it. Starting in verse 1 again. And Joshua arose early in the morning, and they removed from Shittim, and came to Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. So they removed from Shittim, Shittim, a, a city close to Moab, and they lodged uh, here before they passed over. You see, you need a place to lodge as you pray and prepare in the Scriptures. You need a place to lodge and do this. For you, for me, it's in my car, rising up early in the morning. So Joshua, he rises up early in the morning, and he's he's got him a place to lodge and get prepared and ready. And it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host, and they commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the Lord your God, and the priests of the priest the Levites bring it, then shall ye remove from your place and go after it. You see, that Ark of the Covenant pictures the Lord's presence, and you need to go after it. Let the Lord go before you. Yet there shall be a space between you and it. That way you'll be able to see where to go. And about 2,000 cubits by measure, come not near unto it, that you may know the way by which you must go. For ye have not passed this way heretofore. So they had a space between them and the Ark. I mean, this was a lot of people, so they'd need to stand back some, or they, if they was all on top of it, they wouldn't be able to see where it was going. And it says they had not passed this way heretofore. You know, when you first got saved and allowing the Lord's presence to lead, it took you, it took you somewhere. You never, you never had been here before. And it's taken you somewhere you've, maybe you're not comfortable with yet. You've never been there before. Just like them following the Ark of the Covenant, not only had they never been to this place before, but they have never followed the Ark of the Covenant before. They was getting led by a pillar of cloud, a uh, pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. And think about it like this: the law puts a space between you and God, and space would allow Israel to see the Ark. So Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua spake unto the priest, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass over before the people. And they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel. You see, he is going to uh, make... Joshua seem just like Moses to the people. Joshua is the second Moses. He is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ who is the prophet like unto Moses. And the Lord's going to magnify him. Showing you, you don't magnify yourself, don't promote yourself. God will magnify you if he sees fit. And thou shalt command the priest that bear the ark of the covenant saying, when ye are come to the brink of the water of Jordan, Ye shall stand still in Jordan. Now I'm going to talk about that too, that standing still. And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, Come hither and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, Hereby ye shall know that the living God is among you, 
and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Hivites and the Perizzites and the Girgashites, the Amorites and the Jebusites. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth passeth over before you into Jordan. See, they go in after it. Now therefore take you twelve men out of the tribes of Israel, out of every tribe of man, and it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of Jordan. I'm going to talk about that too. They're going to rest in the waters. That the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and they shall stand upon an heap. And it came to pass when the people removed from their tents. There's that word again, removed. To remove from their tents to pass over Jordan and the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people. And as they that bear the Ark were coming to Jordan and the feet of the priests that were bear the Ark were dipped in the brim of the water for Jordan overfloweth all his banks all the time of harvest that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon an heap. They stood and rose up upon a heap very far from the city Adam that is beside Zeratan. And those that came down toward the sea of the plain, even the salt sea, fell and were cut off. And the people passed over right against Jericho. And the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground. Now remember that. Stood firm firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan and all the Israelites passed over on dry ground and all the people were passed clean over Jordan so on this road to victory you gotta rise early in the morning but the next thing is you gotta remove from your place in verse 1 remember they removed from Shittim in verse 3, verse 3 it says they removed from their place in verse 14, they removed from their tents. So you, you're removing from your place. You're getting off your seat of not doing anything. And you're getting to work. You're going after His presence. Remember, they follow the Ark of the Covenant. That pictures the presence of the Lord. They're going after it. Now, the Ark of the Covenant, it foreshadows the Lord Jesus Christ it foreshadows the presence of God. Exodus 25, 10 through 11 says it's made of wood, picturing the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's overlaid with gold, picturing the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Exodus 25, 21, uh, the mercy seat goes on the ark, a picture of how our mercy rests on Jesus Christ. The ark of the covenant is a picture of the Lord Jesus, and you're going after him. He's your leader. You're following him. And this was new for Israel. It said, it said there in verse 4, For ye have not passed this way heretofore. Not only had Israel never gone through the Jordan on dry ground, they had never followed the ark. Before they followed the cloud and the fire. They're doing something different. Just like you after you got saved, you're doing something different. You getting on this road, it might be something different. You know, going through the Jordan pictures death to self, beating down the flesh, by rising early in the morning, removing from your place, following the presence of God. You're reckoning yourself dead, like Paul says to do in Romans 6, 11. You've got to reckon yourself dead. In 1 Corinthians 15, 31, Paul talks about how you've got to die daily. You've got to do this daily. You've got to rise early in the morning, remove from your place, and get on this road every day. You're going after the Lord's presence. And you're going after the prize. In verse 3, it says, And they commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then you shall remove from your place and go after it. You ever heard somebody say that? They say, get after it. He said, remove from your place and go after it. And all common sayings originate from the scriptures. Get after it. Start moving. Everyone wants the prize. Everybody wants the reward. Everybody wants the feeling. But you must go after these things. You know the facts that God has the power to take you through the Jordan. Now remove from your place by faith and go through the Jordan and then you'll get the feeling you want. You know, in the moment it might be hard to rise early. 
but you got to pry your eyes open to meditate with God and you remove from your place so you can rest your feet. Just like I told you, I said, look at that word rest in verse 13. And it shall come to pass as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and they shall stand upon a heap. So, rest your feet. Even in the midst of dangerous waters, even in the midst of work, the feet of the priest would rest in the waters. And now let's talk about where those phrases like stand strong, stand still, stand firm. He said in verse 13 about standing strong. And it shall come to pass as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of Jordan. You see, their feet, they're going to stand strong. Once the priest's feet get in the water, God was going to cut off the waters of Jordan so that they could go through on dry ground. They just had to get their feet wet. You know that common saying, get your feet wet. You haven't even gotten your feet wet. They would bear the ark of the Lord, so they would have to be standing strong. You're going to have to stand strong. On the road to victory, you're carrying something. You're carrying burdens of others, Galatians 6.2. You're carrying your own burdens, Galatians 6, 5. You're carrying your cross, Matthew 16, 24. You're going to be standing strong. And since bearing what God wants you to bear brings peace, at the same time, you're resting your feet on this road to a recovery, this road to a victory. Paul says, watch ye, stand fast in the faith. Quit ye like men, be strong. You know, there's a sense that you have to be strong yourself, but in a bigger sense, you're not standing strong, you're standing still. In verse 8, he says, And thou shalt command the priests that bear the ark of the covenant, saying, When ye are come to the brink of the water of Jordan, ye shall stand still in Jordan. You know, he commands the priests, When ye are come to the brink of the water of Jordan, ye shall stand still in Jordan. This is what Moses said at the Red Sea Cross, and he said, Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, Exodus 14, 13. You know, the Lord was going to take care of it. You know, on a, on a long drive, I used to be skittish about using the cruise control because, you know, I heard stories about it malfunctioning and not going off. You couldn't get it off. But on this road to victory, you can rest your feet. You can take your feet off the gas in a sense. He still wants you to give the effort but you're standing still, you're resting in Him, and you can take your feet off the gas, and He's in control, and He doesn't malfunction. You know, God wants your effort, but when it comes right down to it, He wants you to stand still so that He can fight the battles, like in Exodus 14, 14. The Lord shall fight for you. So as Paul says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Ephesians six ten. You got to stand strong, in a bigger sense, you stand still, and then, and then you stand firm. Like it said in verse 17, the priests stood firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan. Consider how even greater this makes the miracle. Not only did he stop the water from flowing down, the ground wasn't muddy either. He completely dried it up. So, you know, imagine them trying to carry that Ark of the Covenant through muddy, muddy uh, ground with a million people going through that on muddy ground. They'd never make it. So the Lord dried it up. You might stand strong for a while, but are your feet firm? In Proverbs 12, 3, it says, The root of the righteous shall not be moved. Jesus is the root. He causes you to stand firm. So why are you not farther up the road? When you were on the road, you were hitchhiking on someone else's spirituality, possibly. You were pretending to be driving, and you were making the noises with your mouth, but you never moved. The road to blessing is a narrow way, as the Lord talks about in Matthew seven fourteen. And there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, Proverbs fourteen twelve. but the end thereof are the ways of death. You know, it's a broad way to destruction, Matthew seven thirteen. 
but the end thereof is the way of death. Proverbs 16, 25. If you're saved, you're on the road to heaven, but when it comes to your Christian walk in the flesh, you went off the tracks. You know, you say the road to blessing is hard to drive on, but the way of transgressors is also hard. Proverbs 13, 15. You know, the heated seats on the road should just remind you that hell is hot. The air conditioner on the road should remind you the devil wants to air condition hell. You might as well get on the road to blessing. You'll get flat tires, just patch it up with some good preaching. You might run out of gas, just pull over and rest. It isn't about how fast you finish, just as long as you finish. You can even stop and help your brethren because it isn't about finishing first. You might run into road rage, just for be forget about it and go on. On this road, it's okay to say, are we there yet? You know, you can say, are we there yet on this road? Because it just tells the Lord you're ready for him to come back. Titus 2.13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You know how annoying it is when your kids say, are we there yet? Well, it's not annoying to Jesus Christ because that shows him you're wanting him to come back. Paul says, who did hinder you? In Galatians 5, 7. So what is it that's keeping you off this road to recovery, this road to blessing, this road to victory?